but what I find fascinating, and I don't know if there's a rational explanation, but all the things that we've spoken about our lifestyle, the way a person has really not come to terms with certain things or the way they live their life is not really specific, it's not really healthy or, you know, not, maybe not even healthy being the word, but conducive for their balance. But why is there a medical explanation so for why we see these issues whether it's a brain tumor whether it's these as you as, as you said certain spinal disorders uh, why why do they happen to children then because technically children have really sort of represent the most innocent aspect of humanity right you know this is a scientifically a extremely difficult question to answer now right. in our own textbooks we will have you know, before we study any particular chapter, any brain tumor or any spinal problem or any, you know, they will give you so many reasons why it could be. But when mm. it comes to a given patient and the patient specifically asks, like a little child has come with a brain tumor, you know, what wrong has a child done in its own lifespan to have this kind of a tumor? And this may not be congenital, it may not be something genetic. So we have really no answers to all these. Mm -hmm. uh, so from a scientific angle, I have no answers. So we are a little frank by telling them, you know, I have no answers to why this has happened. But from my scientific knowledge, I know for this problem, what should the approach be? How do we go about it? And I can give you a kind of a roadmap to look forward. And can we together work on to see how we can as best mitigate this problem, do what is conventionally expected outcome for a given problem? So right. uh, this is what we're hearing. Right, which must be very difficult, right? Because it's, 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 you know, you're, you're struggling to kind of be um, rational at the same time. There's so many things, but uh, there's another aspect to your, to your um, life, which I want to talk about now, which is this, this, um, this, I wouldn't say practice or this, but this, part of your life where you've dedicated to understanding uh, the spiritual seeking, which is, um, I, I don't know the exact term, so I, I want you to say it in your own words. So could you talk a little bit about that and maybe we can kind of take it forward from there? Uh, you know, if I really have to answer your question, when a person comes to me and they ask me specifically, you know, why this? Mm. Uh, I cannot answer it through science. I mm -hmm. have to go, go, to, go to it beyond science. Mm -hmm. And whenever it is beyond science, a scientific person will say it's non-science or nonsense. Mm -hmm. But of course, a lot of people, if you develop a certain grapple, are able to come to certain conventional knowledge. Uh, and, uh, you know, my personal interest has been into uh, what is called the end portion of the Vedas or the Vedanta or the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. The Upanishadic wisdom has helped me personally a great deal to be a physician, to be a doctor, to be able to ha handle my own emotions, to be able to help people. And if you go through this, you know, from the wisdom of the Vedas, and uh, there is something called the karmic law. Mm -hmm. Now, extremely difficult for a person initially to be able to accept it. Now, the, kar the karma theory says that we have not only lived one life, we have lived many lives. Mm. And why am I born to a good family, uh, you know, a family that takes good care of me, has got reasonably good uh, economic resources, education, so on, is good karma. Why is somebody born to an alcoholic family where there is a lot of abuse not taken care of? Very difficult to accept, but that it is, it says it is all is product of our karma. Now, you know, I had a cousin who was going through a, a, a cancer. Mm -hmm. She was uh, not, you know, uh, not too old enough to die. She was less than 60. Right. And uh, she had gone through chemotherapy. She had become skin and bone. I was seeing her after a long time. I entered the ICU of another hospital and I was looking for her. And I could see somebody staring from the corner of her eyes. Her eyes were popping up. Uh, because the body had become almost like a skeleton. Mm -hmm. She recognized me. I went to her and spoke to her for some time. And then uh, one question she had to me is, you know, why did I have to go through all, all this? Yeah. And after some time, I said, uh, you know, it's all because of karma. And believe me, 
uh, her daughter called me up and said, you know, my mother was so much at peace after she heard what you said. You know, her resistance, her battle, she suddenly seemed to give up because she seemed to be convinced that, you know, all her karmic debts were being cleared in a certain way. Uh, so some people, and I've seen people who may not be Hindus, who belong to another community. Mm. Now, even for a Muslim, let's say, you know, there is a certain prayer called Inshallah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, we, we deal with a lot of people coming from Bangladesh and, you know, inshallah is something they you use very often. Mm -hmm. And you use the word inshallah, you know, when helping them to accept the will of the Lord, mm -hmm. suddenly a kind of a resistance to what they were battling with goes away. You know, the problem is problem. You have a certain problem. But when I offer a certain resistance to it, I compound that problem. But when I, when my resistance goes, 50% of the inner battle goes and it becomes easier for the doctor to handle and do whatever you can. So part of us, in that way, I find the karma theory because scientifically I cannot explain. But mm. many people are able to accept the law of karma and seeing when I'm going through my suffering, maybe my karmic debts are being cleared and maybe I do not know, I must have done something wrong. And this is clearing my account. And I find that, you know, in, in today's um, increasingly intolerant way of looking at life, some people would say, how is someone who's so scientifically brilliant, who's reached the pinnacle of his field, who's the director of one of the most prestigious, um, you know, institutions for neurosciences, um, who's, you know, and I, I'm saying a lot of people in India love the thing that you're, 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 you've studied so hard, you're, you're a doctor. And then they say, oh, but religion and science can never go together. And of course, I understand the Vedas are not, quote unquote, religious texts in that way, but they go beyond that. And I mean, I don't mean religion in today's context, which is politicized, but I mean, it goes back to ancient knowledge. But when you merge the two, um, and, and, and rather, how do you go beyond your mind of technical terms, medical terms, that, and, and kind of find a way to accept these uh, theories, say, for instance, karma or the, the idea of um, living beyond this particular manifestation of uh, a human experience and how to take it forward, that various other words for it, which I, I don't want to butcher by saying it wrong. But how do you kind of broaden your mind to include these and also, more importantly, a implement this into the way you look at life and the way you kind of treat people through that. Yes, Sandeep. Uh, I have been working in this hospital for almost for 20 years now. And when I joined this hospital, I had absolutely no idea about this aspect of religion, about the Gita or the knowledge of Vedanta, absolutely none. I was just like any other doctor who had some idea that, you know, among these scriptures, there is something called the Bhagavad Gita and so on. It so happened that our hospital opened up a unit at Chinanishan Hospital. Mm -hmm. And there I asked uh, Swamiji there to inaugurate our services. And this little interaction, one led to another uh, because he asked me to be the chief guest for a Bhagavad Gita program. And I thought I had to get some idea of the Gita that forced me to look into certain audios on the Gita. Mm -hmm. That uh, exposure has transformed my life. And once I discovered something so wonderful in the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedanta, the next big step that I really did was introduce it to my own colleagues in hospital. Mm -hmm. It was amazing that so many doctors and nurses, you know, this is, uh, although I'm introducing, uh, I would not bring in only the Gita, I would bring in all religions. And you have, you know, most of our nurses are Christians. So we would have classes in hospital with all groups of people. Once a week, I would do this and expose my learnings to a lot of people. It happened that uh, Al Jazeera was doing a documentary on Dr. Devi Shetty. Mm -hmm. And they heard that, you know, some sort of meditation and yoga and uh, spiritual inputs were ha happening in a hospital. Uh -huh. So they were always, always looking at something. So in one of their episodes, they included my classes that I have taken for our people. So what really went through is so many cardiologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons now have become open to integrating spiritual wisdom along with their medical practice. I can honestly say uh, the ability to handle themselves have become better. 
the way they treat patients have become better. Now, one of the things that they have really learned is how blessed we are to be on the other side to be able to treat a patient. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, uh, a doctor's existence depends on the patient. You know, when you are a super specialist and when you have so many people waiting, sometimes there is an ego that feels, you know, a sense of arrogance, let them wait. Yeah, but on yeah. the other hand, when you realize that my existence is dependent on them, they are paying for me. I come to a hospital, but they are, more, you know, they are being billed and my car and my travel and everything comes from them. And the more I value them. So, as I said, when I come to meeting a particular patient, if I have 15 minutes per patient, those moments I'm 100% available for them. And I've seen this with Dr. Devi Shetty. You know, his secretary may be bringing another phone or a call, but when he is with a patient, he's 100%. He's with them, you know, looking into their eyes, feeling their pulse, feeling their heartbeat, really. And then until their last question, you know, one of his style is, is there anything else you want to ask? You know, he always concludes with that. He, there should not be a feeling that the doctor has not given enough time. You know, right. however busy you are, uh, the patient is the most important person. And if you value the patient and the patient creates a doctor, and I am there because of the patient, then you give your time, you give your 100% whenever you're with them. And does this seem to be um, ac being accepted? Because you said it is in your hospital with your colleagues and with the staff, but how much of this is uh, can be integrated going forward because it feels like it's important not just with the the, the with medic medical practitioners but with everyone right if if because it seems like even a one on one conversation uh, with other professionals seems to be so distracted filled with looking at your cell phone waiting you know seeming to be so busy that your thoughts are all over the place so it, let's stick to sort of specifically to medicine but do you see a future where these two uh, fields of spiritual, um, I wouldn't say awakening, because that's too profound an experience, but even a initial integration of spiritual texts into something as scientific as medicine can uh, be the future of what we can kind of, kind of train the future stuff. Uh, let, let me go back to the previous thing. You know, how do you uh, integrate spiritual aspects because in a scientific world because you know normal science would not accept spirituality mm. although these are more anecdotal that i've seen as exposed to a few doctors in our hospital but this is a uh, uh, i really really hope that this would happen over a period of time that doctors are able to integrate certain humanistic values, certain spiritual values, because this field compared to any other field, uh, I think is one of the greatest uh, opportunities that you get in handling another human being. Mm -hmm. To be able to value that person as the most important person at all my training, I'm available for you. And when you do that, and we are not focused on what is it that I can get from him. Yeah. You know, it should be the other way around. You know, I'm not here to be able to extract from this person depending upon his ability to pay. On the other hand, let me see what I can do. Then it becomes a win-win approach. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I will tell you, uh, a patient and a family can easily see through you. Are you here to extract from them or are you here to give? And... Uh, I think doctors over a period of time, as they become a little more senior, they learn this in their own practice. Mm. That unless you are here to give, uh, the real success comes by the more you give. You know, the more you contribute is the more you get. And, you know, that's an interesting thing when, you know, uh, you look at, uh, again, the 50s, 60s, 70s, when it comes to psychologists who... Uh, were, were very dismissive of these texts, especially when it comes to the consciousness. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in Vedanta, there's 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 a uh, belief or rather there's a saying that we're all part of the same consciousness and we are almost, for lack of a better example, like waves and an ocean where we uh, uh, come back and we, we, we don't really have an identity of our own, but the self is a part of a larger thing. Now, a lot of them dismiss this, and now the, the, they're going back to certain texts and saying, hey, this is actually proven in science. 
um, what, how do you kind of uh, approach this and how do you apply it to your life? Very true. Absolutely true that conventional psychology and conventional medicine uh, are not able to accept this Vedantic view that we are all essentially the same, like one ocean and all of us different waves. <clears throat> and, you know, the benefit of being able to see is that you're able to see oneness in each other or the mm. essential oneness in each other. Although we may differ in color, we may differ in, you know, external features, but we are all, if I'm able to see myself in you and uh, you in me, uh, that is what uh, the real essence of all Vedanta is. Conventional medicine, conventional psychology finds it extremely difficult, would not accept this. But yeah. I have seen something very unusual. That means those of our doctors who have been through this uh, understanding of this consciousness and Vedanta, when they go to medical meetings and when they speak, you know, uh, without their knowledge, they are speaking more of Vedanta than they are speaking conventional uh, uh, or uh, traditional psychiatry and psychology. Mm. And beauty is even in medical meetings, they're being accepted, even mm. in medical meeting. And as you said, you know, more and more in quantum physics and science, the whole Vedantic theory that we are, you know, this whole world difficult to believe. That's what Vedanta says is not as real as you think. It is more of an appearance. Uh, uh, so this is one of the last things we say because people find it extremely difficult to believe that the world may not be as real as you think. Mm. Uh, and the reality is the observer, the one who's watching is more real than anything else that you observe. 